Hey guys, welcome to the second Artist Journal entry. A few days behind schedule, but the weather has been unbelievable. 18 degrees Celsius in Berlin. But let's get right to it. Uh, today I want to talk about NFTs. And because it's just such a hot topic right now, I was on Clubhouse, which is the, I think it's iPhone only app now, the audio app that's sort of taken the world by storm a little bit. And there is a lot of talk about NFTs. And I just randomly clicked a notification. And before I knew it, I was talking about the issue to a whole bunch of people, which is maybe why it's such a popular platform. It's kind of great. Anyway, someone reached out, this artist, MJ, she's out of Brooklyn. And she just wanted to have a Zoom call and to uh, ask me about it. And I thought, you know what, this is kind of, this is fodder for my journal here. So this is what we discussed. And I thought maybe it'd help a lot of you out there who are trying to figure out what NFTs even are and what the deal is. And just a quick little post here. So NFTs are on the Ethereum blockchain. So it's kind of a crypto related technology, okay? In a sense, like just like there's Bitcoin, which is a cryptocurrency, there is Ethereum, which is a cryptocurrency. And one of the features of Ethereum is you can make unique NFTs or non-fungible tokens. So this is, of course, the, one of the earliest use cases of this is digital art, because all of a sudden it provides a way to sell your digital art in a credible way. This isn't selling a JPEG. It's just like Bitcoin. If I give you a Bitcoin, you now have the Bitcoin and I no longer have the Bitcoin. And that's what's kind of beautiful about this. And so we discussed in our last video too about how provenance is also a major factor with why this whole system works. So um, MJ was looking for tips, and so I'm calling this post NFT strategies for artists, especially if you're just coming into this and you're trying to figure out what to do. Now, ideally, you end up on a curated platform, and so that would be something like Super Rare, which I have on the screen here. Let me just see. Yeah, so we have Super Rare. There's also Known Origin is another big one. They take uh, applications a few days a month. I think actually they're doing it right now for another couple of days and they kind of hide their form a little bit. I think they're all of these platforms are getting massive demand though. So don't feel too bad if you're not getting accepted right away. Uh, I have a feeling they're going to probably try and scale up, but they are curated. So anyways, also if you get on something like Maker's Place, this is another one. Um, and you can see, so yeah, and so people shop their wares, put their uh, digital art out there. Now, one that you can go on that is open and that is not curated, but it still kind of has respectability is OpenSea. And this is where I recommend people start. Now, I haven't used OpenSea, but I think I will because I'm putting out this Peloponnesian War trading card series here. This is just one of the sheets. There's actually six of these sheets. There's 220 cards here. And I was thinking about it for a long time and I was realized I don't want to release these as one of ones on Super Rare. Maybe some of the studies that I make for it make sense that, okay, or a weird variation. Okay, I can sell that as a one of one. But the actual trading card art book series, I would actually like to have maybe 100 or 500 and maybe people will try and collect them all, right? So it took me a while to kind of figure out how to approach that. So... OpenSea, as you can see here, I, I may sign up and what I've heard about it from other artists that have actually used it is you kind of pay once and then after that, the, uh, the buyer will actually pay for minting the token. And this is different from something like Super Rare, where I as the artist will mint the token. So I pay the fee up front. And these days, fees are pretty expensive, anywhere from... 75 to 300 dollars you're paying to make your thing and this is because ethereum is in the middle of a gas crisis right now and they're working on this this is a temporary situation as the fed says this is transitory inflation here but uh nevertheless uh i think open sea is kind of the perfect place to get your feet wet if you're new to this um there's also rareable which is here 
Um, now, unfortunately, I think you can use wearable. There's nothing wrong with it. But from a branding perspective, for whatever reason, wearable just, it sort of has this eBay feeling to it. I mean, here's Lindsay Lowen, so let's not trash wearable too much. But for whatever reason, the branding of wearable is not of the same caliber as even OpenSea. And it's just not seen as kind of great from my perspective and just from what I gather from just sort of reading the tea leaves and listening to interviews. There's sort of a, I would sort of want to be on something like OpenSea, let's say, but there are benefits and on Rarible, you would mint it yourself, for instance, whereas on OpenSea, you wouldn't. So maybe you want to mint it for certain reasons, um, but this is pretty much the landscape. So, um, so yeah, so this is the approach I would recommend. And before we actually, let's just finish the tour here. And then we have NBA Top Shot. Now, this is kind of like, so backing up just a second. Now, MJ had told me that, you know, she knew a poet that had minted a poem as an NFT. So, you know, I don't see why not. It's a video and you can do it. And New York poet, maybe they're on the bleeding edge. In a sense, it's kind of smart branding, you might say. It's like, that's a good way to get an article written about you. As far as the actual use case, I, I think there are questions. I mean, do you really want to buy someone's poem for, I would, you know, I'd probably just buy the book. Do I need to own someone's poem? But maybe there is a case that can be made. Like, let's look at, you know, it, it, and actually, before we continue, and she also talked about a performance artist on some porn site that I'd never heard of. Uh, what was it called? I can't even remember. And uh, and she was saying that, you know, this performance artist was wanted to sell their videos uh, as NFTs. So you can see it's just a bit of a gold rush here in the whole NFT space. And I, but I think this NBA uh, website and Top Shots kind of captures kind of the amazing thing, which is we're moving from social media, a social media laden world where we kind of create these desirable posts and show how great we are and creating this desire for an, and this envy. And we're moving from that to actually a marketplace of moments, we've kind of we're kind of moving towards com the commodification of the moment, and this is what we're seeing with this NBA Top Shots. Own the moments, own the best moments from NBA history. So, and people are spending absolute fortunes on this. So, it's it'll be interesting to see if that part sticks around. I, I think the use case for digital art for me is solid because it actually provides a solution through cryptocurrency technology of creating uh, uh, an, something of digital value beyond a JPEG or a little .mov or mp4 file. Um, so finally, this is what I told MJ as far as just, you know, NFT strategy for artists. Try and get on a curated platform. We've gone through them before. And if you can't, just start with OpenSea and get your feet wet. Learn MetaMask, which is an Ethereum-based wallet. There's a bit of a learning curve if you've never actually engaged with crypto. And, and so you're going to have to download MetaMask and understand what that is. And that's where you would store your digital collectibles as well as your cryptocurrencies, some of them, um, your Ethereum-based crypto. Uh, so now as far as the actual art making process, I think I have a twofold strategy, which is for digital art, it's a great way to sell your digital art. It's a perfect kind of solution for art that you make digitally and you want to sell and you actually never need to make a physical work in the, like it, it kind of stays purely natively on the, in the digital world and you buy and sell it there. So that's beautiful. But as far as your physical works are concerned, um, I think it's also kind of worthwhile to uh, to include an NFT 
as part of your physical work that you're selling. So if you are selling, say, this work behind me here, include a digital version of this. I mean, it started as a digital work. I mean, now that's a digital printed with screen printing over top. Uh, but I could easily include a digital version of that work, which is kind of where it started anyway. And that not only acts as a value add that you're actually getting the digital version, which may be worth more in the long run. When you think of us flying around in starships, are you going to be carrying on your painting onto the starship? No, but you may have your little digital artwork that you flick on the wall and have accompanying you. Now, there's also another value, which is it's kind of like a certificate of authenticity. And as anybody that's sold art knows, when you include a certificate of authenticity, it really gives a lot of value to the work. And here you're kind of doing that on the blockchain. You're verifying it on the blockchain. And so that also acts as a real value add. So it kind of gives a more professional, this was our sort of mutual conclusion as we were having this discussion last night, it gives a more professional sort of, it shows that you're a plugged in artist if you're sort of including the NFT. It makes it a much more appealing buy. This isn't just a drawing on the wall. I got something in my wallet. I'm getting value here. Um, something that I can sell. You know, maybe I want to keep the physical and sell the digital. Um, so that's an interesting idea too. And it also acts as a receipt. I mean, all, you know, when you buy and sell it, you, you, you know, you give me your 0.5 or your one Ethereum for the work, and then you get the work and that's all verified on the blockchain. And so that provenance becomes very apparent. So in conclusion, there is a certain trendiness, obviously, to uh, NFTs right now. I mean, it's kind of the hot new thing. Tons of money is being spent on it. Uh, you, again, you have these, what I almost hesitate to call nouveau riche crypto millionaire collectors who, you know, they have all the money in the world all of a sudden. If you bought Ethereum for 30 cents, which is now trading for $1,700. Um, and so they're getting into the art world and you see it actually, the aesthetic of so-called crypto art is being uh, has its own aesthetic and it is its own thing, and I, I, which is a whole other conversation that we'll get into. Um, and so the use cases, I think, for digital art and conclusion are solid. I, I think it's really solid. As far as this performance stuff or putting a poem, I think that's in the experimental stage. I think it's a great way to get attention if you're a poet, which is probably not easy to get attention as a poet. So I say, why not? Um, it's probably a great way to have a news story written about you. Um, but yeah, so I think it's, it's something you can't ignore, I, I would say. And I think basically every visual artist really should be starting to dip their toes in this and starting to get, be, make themselves aware of what's going on. Because it really is, if you work with anything digital and even physical, there is a use case for this and probably more and more collectors may judge you fairly or unfairly on whether you have an NFT strategy. All right, that's all for now. Meeting a couple of curators today as far as the latest on, on the art practice here. And uh, so lots of exciting stuff on that front. And otherwise, I'm just going to keep working on trying to make these prints more and more high quality. Uh, so we've got the Canon Pro Max 1000 here ready to go. So thanks for tuning in and we'll see you on the next Artist Journal.